Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Jung Schroden Memorial Observatory. My name is Jan Kabi. I am an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, and I'm the coordinator for the Jung Schroden Observatory. Um, today, we'll do a brief reenactment of the opening ceremony that happened to the day 75 years ago, October 25th, 1940. It's a pleasure to introduce that I am the first um, astronomer at Western, Dr. H.R. Kingston, who will be giving some opening remarks using some lantern slides. Thank you very much, Jan. Do dreams ever come true? Today we are able to say that at least one dream has even more than come true. For many years, the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at the University of Western Ontario and the members of the London Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada have dreamed a dream and seen a vision. Today that vision is a reality in this beautiful Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory and Telescope and made possible by the generosity of Mrs. Cronin. It will be recalled that Mr. Cronin as London's representative at Ottawa during the latter part of the Great War, consistently urged upon the federal government the pressing need for a research bureau for studying Canadian problems. His untiring efforts led to the creation of the National Research Council of Canada. A little over a year ago, upon learning of the efforts of the university to secure a telescope, Mrs. Cronin decided to erect as a memorial to Mr. Cronin and his life's work, an observatory equipped with a suitable telescope. In December, the contract for the telescope and the revolving dome was let to the Perkin Elmer Corporation of New York and the contract for the building to the Potherbo Construction Company. A word of genuine thanks is due to each of these organizations and also to Mr. O'Roy Moore and company, the architects, for their untiring efforts and patience, both in producing a building which is substantial and beautiful, and for the gift that made the entire project possible. We are grateful beyond words to Mrs. Cronin. Perhaps a few remarks about the telescope may be of interest. There are two types of telescopes, reflectors with mirrors and refractors with lenses. Ours is a refractor with a lens, in reality a double lens, 10 inches in diameter. This is the largest lens that has ever been made in the Western Hemisphere. The telescope is electrically driven to follow the motion of the sky and is also electrically controlled. Beyond the foyer on the first floor of the building are an office and a library. Both are turned into instrument rooms for the occasion today. The basement contains a lecture room and a small workshop. On the second floor at the back is an observing deck. With this equipment, we shall be able to conduct some valuable research in certain definite fields, as for example, the problem of obtaining the life history of variable stars. The principal purpose of this equipment, however, is to aid in the teaching of astronomy. Then, too, it will be a great stimulus to the work of the local astronomical society. Further, we wish the observatory to provide a cultural service to all the citizens of London and vicinity, and we shall implement this wish to the utmost of our ability. The observatory has already received some further gifts. A group of models constructed by Reverend W.G. Colgrove has been given for demonstrating astronomical phenomena. These are the most helpful instruments for this purpose that I have ever personally seen. A set of striking astronomical transparencies, some of which you will see on the walls of the foyer, have been made from negatives loaned to us through the courtesy of the David Dunlop Observatory. The members of that staff have already made many helpful suggestions in connection with this project. Thank you, Dr. Chant. A very unusual gift is the Dresden meteorite provided by the directors of the London Life Insurance Company. 
A mirror and an eyepiece for a reflecting telescope have been given by Mr. Dr. Thomas Sparks of St. Mary's, Ontario, and copies of paintings of famous scientific events by the Bausch & Lomb Company of Rochester, New York. To all these persons we offer our sincere thanks, but I must not weary you further. I know you would much prefer to see the building and the telescope for yourselves. It will be open for inspection immediately at the close of these ceremonies, and uh, we hope that you will enjoy your tour very much. May I again express to you, Mrs. Cronin, the most sincere thanks of the University and the Astronomical Society, as well as the citizens of London and of southwestern Ontario for this beautiful and valuable gift. I trust that we may so use it that it will bring to our students and to our citizens in general the maximum of pleasure and profit, and to you and your family and friends, a very real and abiding satisfaction. Thank you very much for your attention today, and I would like to now bring on stage Dr. C. H. Hant from the Dunlop Observatory in Toronto to make a few additional remarks. Thank you very much for being here today from Toronto, Dr. Chant. It is with great pleasure that I bring to you hearty greetings from the University of Toronto, and more particularly from my own institution, the David Dunlop Observatory. I feel I am justified in adding the congratulations of the members of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Professor Kingston has been very active in the work of the Society, and was the president of the entire Society in the years 1930 and 1931. Its members, who are distributed across our broad country, will rejoice in the wonderful reward of his labors here. A short time ago, I came upon a pamphlet published by the Dominion government embodying the observations made in Canada of the transit or passage of the planet Venus across the face of the sun on December the 6th, 1882. This astronomical event was considered very important. It was thought that it offered a method of determining more accurately the distance of the Earth from the Sun, which is the astronomer's yardstick for measuring the universe. I was interested to see a list of the instruments used. Woodstock and Quebec each had an 8-inch telescope, Fredericton a 7-inch, Kingston a 6.5, Montreal a 6.25, and, and Toronto and Whitby each a 6-inch and there are several smaller ones. The telescope at Toronto was installed especially to observe this phenomenon. The majority of these telescopes, belonging to colleges of various types, have been used to some extent in the work of teaching, but not in serious and continued efforts at giving instruction in astronomy. Not one of these telescopes, not one, is in the same class with a 10-inch instrument of the Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory, in power, in mounting, or in convenient housing. Indeed, this is the most effective observatory of instruction in the entire Dominion. Perhaps it marks the beginning of a new era. The observatory is not designed primarily for research, but many important investigations have been made with more modest equipment. And I confidently expect some enthusiasts in this very community to make distinguished observations in the future. These are serious times, with disturbing world happenings every day. We must not lose our mental equilibrium. I contend that the study of astronomy will help us to preserve this. It supplies the mind with noble subjects for quiet consideration. Astronomy reveals the, the relative smallness of the individual person, but it also teaches the great fact that we live in a universe of law and order. Long may the Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory carry on its important and beneficent work. Thank you. I would like now to call upon the past president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada to read a few remarks from various places in Canada 
uh, that have sent telegrams for this occasion. Peter Jadicki. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I have a letter here which was sent to uh, Professor Kami as the director of the observatory. On behalf of the Edmonton Center of the Royal Astronomical Society, it is my honor and pleasure to extend congratulations on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the official opening of the Hume Cronin Observatory. During the past 75 years, the science of astronomy has seen dramatic changes in content and methodology. In contrast, during those same 75 years, the Hume Cronin Observatory has not changed in its commitment to the education of university students and in serving the general public as a reliable source of scientific information and inspiration. That wonderful old refractor and the stone building in which it is housed reflect the solid roles that they play within the university community and within the community at large. They should outlive all who gather for this year's anniversary celebration. 75 years from now, mankind's understanding of the structure of the universe may be dramatically different from what it is today. I anticipate, however, that in 2090, the Hume Cronin Observatory will, in the hands of new staff and dedicated volunteers, still serve the educational and inspirational functions that it does today. I regret not being able to participate in your anniversary celebrations this year, but look forward to visiting the observatory during the RASE's General Assembly in London in 2016. Congratulations to you, to your staff, and to your volunteers on this remar remarkable occasion. Respectfully yours, Dr. Douglas P. Hube, Honorary President of the Edmonton Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And I would just like to add that in 1940, on this date, the person who was the honorary president of the Edmonton Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada then had also sent a similar letter. The second letter that I have says to the staff of the Hume Cronin Observatory, on behalf of the members of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, I wish you congratulations on the 75th anniversary of your historic observatory. Our own Dr. Chant and Mrs. Dunlap attended the opening event in 1940, and I understand that the 254 millimeter refractor at Hume Cronin is the largest refracting telescope currently open to the public in Canada. I hope its operations continue for the indefinite future. Sincerely yours, Eric Briggs, Secretary of the RASC Toronto Centre. Thank you. All right, so this concludes our short historical flashback 75 years ago. It will be now my pleasure to introduce you um, to our facilities. I'll give you a private tour of the entire facility that takes probably about 15 minutes. I'm only going to highlight a few things about the observatory, and after that um, you are completely free to take as much time as you like in the different rooms of the observatory. Um, we have a couple of telescopes set up to uh, look at the sun in a very safe way today, so that's also something unusual. Um, and then if you have any questions, there's many people around that will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. So without further ado, we'll start our tour right outside this room here. One is that there is an asteroid named Hume Cronin. It's named after this Hume Cronin. It was discovered in 1997. And it orbits somewhere between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter around the Sun. And in fact, the person that suggested naming it Hume Cronin is the person that just read these corrections. seen in, in these two rooms and actually the first thing I would like to point out is this very picture here. This is a picture that was taken in the early 40s 
what it shows is an office that was upstairs. It's H.R. Kingston, so the first astronomer in Western, H.R. Kingston's office. And at his desk, we see Reverend Colgrove. Uh, he was an amateur astronomer, but he was very gifted at building teaching aids to teach various aspects about astronomy. And so, this picture from 1940 um, has Colgrove at Kingston's office um, with some toys, tools, with some prints at the back here. What we have tried is to recreate everything you see in that picture. And right here, if you look in this room, you see H.R. Kingston at exactly the same desk, the same chair, telephone, and everything. Right? So please feel free to come in to the period room. Here is the workshop. So we will have three things to do. There's two things I would like to point out. Um, number one is on that side, in a display case, we have the original guest book from October 25th, 1940, 75 years ago. It's open at the first page and on the poster above it um, are some of the names of the people that signed that guest book. The, first. the second thing I would like to point out is there is a display case right here in front and it seems to contain two big rocks. And what it is, is the piece on the left is the very famous Dresden meteorite. Orange. Last month, that gentleman there and myself have painted it in the colors of Western. <laughs> uh, when the telescope came to the observatory, there was this second tube, the one that you see beneath it. That's a Schmidt camera, and it came it as a surprise. Um, it's not that we ordered a big 10 inch telescope and a Schmidt camera, the Schmidt camera was a gift. From the corporation that built it, which is Perkin Elder. You can see it here on the pier, but also on the back. Perkin Elmer Corporation is a very known corporation, certainly their optics division. Uh, this gentleman here, Richard Perkin, traveled all the way from New York on October 25th, 1940, to attend the opening ceremony. Uh, Perkin Elmer made a lot of other uh, instruments. I think maybe their most famous contribution is that they built the mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope. But they also had instruments on the Viking landers on Mars. They did a lot of uh, reconnaissance missions as well. One other thing I would like to point out here is that, as I said, the youngest son of Hugh Cronin uh, became a famous actor. And right there, we have a picture of the actor Hugh Cronin leaning here. The one question that we often get is like, how can you actually see things with the telescope and move things? Well, actually, the dome is completely freestanding. Right? It's a heavy thing, which is good, so it doesn't go away. Now with this. But in here, we actually make it move. All right, and so we can only look through that opening, but we can turn it open to another part of the sky we like. And then we have these computer controlled drones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the way it was done with all kinds. So basically, by carefully thinking where you want to move the telescope to, you can pretty much turn it in a lot of different directions. Against this pier in um, 2000, so 15 years ago, at the occasion of the 60s. And our programs are run um, by volunteers and by some of our graduate students. The best graduate students we select to run these programs, and they do that together with the people from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. There's a um, poster there describing some of their activities. They help us out um, with setting up a telescope to people. And actually, right now, we have some telescopes outside trained to the sun, and so you can look at the sun in a very safe way. You should never ever, though, look directly at the sun without proper protection, because there is no pain nerves in your eyes, so you can easily burn your retina without feeling it. Now it'll be good. What happens is, when you open the shutter, light comes in, hits a parabolic mirror at the back of the telescope, mm -hmm. comes off the sheet of cold, and hits the, um, hits the film, and you can take a wide angle picture of the sky with that.
look, when your eyes right over top of it, you see the round ball there. 